Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run through the introductions while we, the rest of you finish getting your food. Um, if you want some more food, there's plenty out there. Feel free. Just please go out the back door and, and come back in that way. Um, our speaker today is Stuart Anderson, who we've been calling from Cato, but he's really not that much from Cato. He's affiliated with Cato, but he is also the executive director of the uh, National Foundation for American Policy, uh, which is, I assume, your, your main full-time job, which I did not realize until today when he corrected me. Um, before that, he was uh, he worked with the Senate Immigration Subcommittee, which I actually worked for this summer. It's a great experience. If anyone's interested in doing that this summer, let me know, and um, we could talk about how to how to work that out. Um, he worked for Senator Spencer Abraham and then Senator Sam Brownback as staff director. He was also an executive associate commissioner with the INS. His experience in all different areas. His master's degree is from Georgetown. Uh, and now he's a, just a policy ex just he's an expert a policy expert on immigration and uh, he writes and speaks on it providing comments today is our own professor howard chang um, whose list of degrees is too long for me to even read to you today uh, not really he has a phd in economics from mit his jd is from harvard and he has an mpa from princeton very impressive um, he's taught here since 1999 um, and his joint expertise in economics and law makes him obviously a very useful scholar and allows him to write articles like endogenous decentralization in federal environmental policies. So I'm sure you'll all be pulling that up during the talk and reading it, but please try to pay attention. Um, and with that, Mr. Stuart Anderson. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the history of immigration then talk about what Congress should do on immigration, then talk about what Congress will do on immigration. Uh, you know, not that long ago I was uh, watching uh, TV and Lord of the Rings came on, and there was a part on there that I hadn't really remembered before where one of the characters says, you know, the penalty for entering Gondor without permission is immediate execution. I was thinking, gee, they really had strict immigration policies back then. <laughs> But the irony is, if you're talking about back then and you're talking about America, not only weren't there strict immigration policies, there are actually no immigration policies. The first people who came over uh, to Plymouth Rock, to Jamestown, they obviously did not have a visa. Uh, if you go through the Revolutionary Period, again, no immigration restrictions. Uh, constitutional Period, War of 1812, American Civil War, still no restrictions on immigration to the United States. First actual restrictions uh, did not appear until 1882 with the, uh, with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was aimed at preventing people from China from both uh, immigrating and naturalizing in the United States. And it was important as a precursor to the later uh, restrictions, because these are ethnically and racially uh, you know, motivated, in a sense, and, and actually and, and defined by law. Uh, and that's what we saw in 1921 and 1924, where you had the national origins quotas, which were aimed to prevent uh, people primarily from Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, particularly aimed against Jews, uh, from being able to immigrate to the United States. And a lot of it was based on the intellectual theory that was popular at the time called the eugenics, uh, which the idea that different people from different races or ethnicity were inferior to others. Uh, such that the debate over immigration centered around such things as the skull sizes of the best immigrants to have into the United States. And, and those, those were the kind of arguments that were had. And we know that eugenics you know, theory was, was you know, in ascendancy in the United States during this period because 1928, there was a famous uh, Buck v. Bell decision with the Supreme Court where actually it upheld basically eugenics policies to uh, allow the sterilization of someone essentially because they were you know, essentially poor and not educated very well. Uh, so pretty much from 1924 through 1965, you, you had this, this immigration restrictions, these national origins quotas govern, you know, govern immigration law. Uh, there were some exceptions put in after World War II where we accepted refugees uh, and 1952 law, but essentially th that's what held these restrictions. And the 1965 Act, uh, to show how important it was, 
in that it, it got rid of the national origins quotas uh, without getting rid of the national origins quotas. If any of you know anyone from India or China or South Korea, essentially they wouldn't be allowed uh, to have immigrated to the United States uh, without getting rid of the national origins quotas because there was something called an Asiatic Bard Zone, um, which basically prevented anyone from Asia from, from immigrating to the United States. Um, if you want a really quick history of immigration legislation, we can go back up through to 1986, really the next major piece of legislation uh, in which you had uh, a combination of an amnesty for people in the country illegally and also for the first time making it illegal to hire someone who was in the country illegally. Um, if anyone you've had to fill out an I-9 form for work, that's essentially where, where it comes from, the 1986 law. Uh, 1990, there was actually an increase in legal immigration, both family and employment immigration. Um, and 1996, there was an attempt to actually have large cuts in legal immigration, uh, but those were defeated by a combination of kind of Reagan conservatives and liberal Democrats in, in coalition in the House and Senate. Uh, although there was a there, there was a bill that did pass in 1986 that had a, a lot of enforcement provisions, particularly aimed at making it more difficult for someone who was in the country illegally to be able to stay here in, in, in any form. And really, since 1996, uh, except for some visa tightening after after 9-11 uh, and a number of, s of smaller bills, there's really been no major legislation uh, that's passed Congress. Uh, in 2006-2007, there were big attempts to pass uh, major legis legislation, immigration reform. Uh, those ultimately didn't become a law. And really, up until you get us up to the present day, where you had last year, the Senate passed a, a large bill, a comprehensive bill on immigration, and now the House has passed a series of smaller bills through the Judiciary Committee, and that brings us kind of up to the present day on legislation. But a lot was a lot's been happening, or a lot did happen on immigration um, that didn't have to do with particularly what Congress itself did. Um, in just before 9/11, there was a possibility of an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico on migration, which would have been a landmark agreement. I actually participated in those talks when I was part of the Bush administration. Uh, and we were actually very close to having an agreement with Mexico that would have been put before Congress that would have not only legalized people, but really more importantly, had a way for people to come in legally for Mexico to work and, and, and have that done in a bilateral way. And we would have gotten uh, increased enforcement uh, cooperation from Mexico. It would have been a real, you know, a real, uh, a real uh, agreement that would have made a significant difference. Uh, that was not possible after 9-11. Um, but there, have, there was a precedent for having agreements with Mexico on immigration. If you go back to 1942, there was the Bracero program was established that allowed US, uh, the U.S. to have workers come in to work in agriculture for Mexico, which is important because of the labor shortages that were going on at the time during World War II. And the Reserve Program became particularly important about 10 years later when the early 1950s became the first real big concerns about illegal immigration to the United States. Um, and it was a political concern, and when there's political concerns, there's going to be action. And the INS commissioner at the time, named General Swing, went down to the border, and he said to the growers, look, we're going to have a crackdown on illegal immigration. But at the same time, we're going to make it easier to use this Bracero program, make it less bureaucratic, so we can have an increase in these Bracero admissions so you could re replace the illegal flow of workers with a legal flow. And that's exactly what happened. There was a crackdown um, with the uh, very politically incorrect name, Operation Wetback. Uh, and with that enforcement crackdown, though, there also became a, uh, an increase in the Bracero admissions, such that they doubled or tripled. And it really became one of the great social science experiments of the 20th century, uh, asking the question of what would happen if you give people the legal option of coming in to work, would, would they do so rather than come in illegally? And really the answer was a resounding yes. Um, apprehensions at the border are really the best proxy for illegal entry. Well. When, before the, the increase in the Bracero admission started in 1953, you had about a million apprehensions at the border. By 1959, that had dropped to 40,000. So illegal entry as, as measure of apprehensions dropped by 95%. At the, because at the same time, Bracero admissions doubled and then almost tripled. Uh, so we had really by far the most successful way 
to reduce and really largely eliminate illegal entry to the United States, which was having some type of market mechanism for people who could come in and work legally. But what happened? Well, there were complaints that people in the Bracero program weren't being treated well enough. Labor unions were concerned about the competition. So by 1964, the Bracero program ended. Uh, and this is really where the story of illegal immigration that we have up to the present day really starts. Because from 1964 to 1976, apprehensions at the border, again, a proxy for illegal entry, increased by 1,000%. The exact opposite of what we saw between 53 and 59 with the Bracero motions, uh, admissions when the illegal entry dropped by 95%, then you started to see the huge increases in illegal entry because there not only wasn't a legal way for people for people to come in for work in agriculture, but there also wasn't a legal way to work in other types of jobs, construction, hotels, restaurants, etc. So eventually there became a political response again as the illegal entry continued. So by the early 90s the big political response was to increase the border patrol agents and also to have uh, a policy of deterrence to try to push illegal entry, illegal entry to more remote areas, which in turn turned out to be more dangerous areas. Well, was this a successful policy? Really, I, I think by any measure, it, it hasn't been successful. Uh, but to give you an idea of the numbers, when the Border Patrol buildup started, you had about 3,500 Border Patrol agents uh, in the early 90s. That increased eventually to 5,000 and then 10,000 by the Bush administration. Over the course of the Bush administration, you had uh, went up to 15,000, and then up to the present day, you now have 21,000 Border Patrol agents uh, from that initial 3,500, and the Senate passed bill would increase that to over 40,000. I'm really not sure why any of you are in law school. There's really a lot of good jobs out there in the, in the Border Patrol. Uh, clearly the fastest growing occupation in America. Uh, but what happened during that time? Did illegal immigration stop? Did people not come anymore? No, you had really what's called an unintended consequence. Now, all of us in our lives have unintended consequences in things we do, but when the government does them, they tend to be much bigger consequences. And in this case, the consequence really was quite big. Um, as it became more dangerous and more difficult, once people came across the border, instead of going back and forth like they often used to, they ended up staying and developing ties and, and even uh, having families. Uh, by the early 90s, you had about 3.5 million people in the country illegally. By today, you have about 11.5 million. So really, what the policy of, of focusing on border enforcement and not having any sort of legal way for people to come in at these lower skilled jobs, what it accomplished was really to take a, a circular migration a flow where people came in for a while, worked, and went back, and turned it into a permanent migration uh, with all the attendant problems uh, that had, in addition to pushing people into more dangerous areas, which affected such things as property rights in Arizona and affected the politics uh, there. And also, on a more human level, you had the problem of of how dangerous it was. I did some research last year that showed that the number of deaths for people trying to come in to the United States was actually the second highest on record, almost 500 people dying trying to come in. And in fact, I also calculated that when you take into account that fewer people have been trying to come in to the country in recent years because of the economy, uh, that someone is about eight times more likely to die trying to come in today than they were maybe eight or 10 years ago. So there's a serious human uh, dimension to this, but it also uh, mixes in with the increase that we've seen in the total illegal immigrant population because of the danger and, and the difficulty, but not the impossibility of, of entering the United States illegally. Um, so that brings us to really what I think is the most important reform that should be made in, in any immigration bill, which is to have uh, a generous number of low-skill visas for people to come in and work legally. Uh, these visas can be as portable as people would want them to be. So people, once they start working for one employer, they can go work for another employer. But it would really have a significant impact on both illegal immigration and on saving people's lives. And also it would take a lot of the profits away from the human smuggling cartels, who really are the ones that are profiting the most now by this current, you know, current really black market and labor. 
What's another important reform that should be made? Well, another really key reform is on high-skill immigration. Um, we need more both uh, H-1B visas, which are the temporary visas that allow people to be hired as skilled foreign nationals, and also green cards that allow people to stay here permanently. Why do we need to do that? Well, if any of you go to a college campus, and hey, we're on one, so this is, this is one. Uh, but if you go to this one or another one, you will find that at the graduate school level, um, that, uh, that the international students, for example, in electric, electrical engineering, uh, will represent about 70% of the graduate students. Uh, in computer science, about 63% of the computer science graduate students are international students. In other science and tech fields, it's over 50%. Uh, so when companies go on campus and they recruit or they do it virtually, uh, what they'll find is that um, they'll often need a visa if they want to hire someone. They'll hire Americans, of course, but they also want to hire uh, other people uh, and don't want to foreclose the opportunity to hire somewhere between 50 to 70 percent of the potential labor pool because, quite frankly, their competitors aren't going to be so generous and, and not hire these people. I mean, these, these people are, are highly educated and sought after. Uh, but if you want to have them hired and work in the U.S., where the jobs and, and investment and, and innovation can take place, they would have to get what's called an H-1B temporary visa. But those visas have been used up every year for the past uh, 10 or 11 years before the beginning or even the end of the, or the, end of the fiscal year. Um, for, for example, last year, the, when employers applied, six months before the fiscal year started, all the visas were used up. In fact, they were used up plus about 40,000 that weren't even able to be distributed. Uh, what happens in such cases? Well, sometimes people can stay in the country for a little while on what's called optional practical training, but if they're abroad, they aren't going to be able to come in. Uh, and if they, if they don't qualify for one of these other, uh, other ways of staying here, they're pretty much going to end up getting hired outside the United States. So it's really not an issue of being sympathetic towards the international students. They are very talented and they're going to get hired somewhere. The question is whether they're going to get hired in the U.S. And if they get hired abroad, they could get hired abroad by the United States or they can get hired abroad by, by foreign competitors. And related to that is the issue of that even when someone gets a temporary status, um, that doesn't allow them to stay here permanently, you'd have to get a green card. But the green card wait times could be six to ten years or longer, particularly from India or China, because of the low quotas. And there's also within those quotas per country limits as well. Um, so that make it longer for people from, from larger, larger countries. Uh, the reason the green cards are important is allows someone to maintain and build their career or even start a a company, and that can be very significant because there's also no such thing as an entrepreneur visa in the United States under the U.S. immigration system. Uh, I know of example of four uh, students from the University of Maryland. They came close to winning an entrepreneur contest. They went to an immigration attorney and said, look, we want to solidify this so we can get going with our company after graduation. The attorney said, forget it. You're not going to be able to get permission from the immigration service. So. Um, two of the people actually ended up leaving the country. One was lucky enough to win the diversity visa lottery, and the fourth one ended up working for Microsoft. So the two that stayed in the country uh, got together about 10 years later, and they started fooling around on Facebook, and they ended up creating uh, what became a big social, social uh, network, internet dating site called Zeusk, which has about 20 million registered users, uh, employs a couple hundred people out in California. They, um, they're actually going to go and become publicly traded next year, if that's your thing, to look for those kind of companies. And, uh, and uh, but it's interesting, sometimes I'll get questions about, well, <clears throat> what about brain drain? What about, you know, people, you know, wouldn't they have been able to do this in their home country? I mean, both these guys are from Iran. I'm not sure if they would have been, they would have been able to have the opportunity to set this big internet dating site up in, in Iran. But uh, the, the point is, is that by being in the U.S., they had an opportunity to have an idea and the freedom to be able to, to pursue it. Um, and this, free, this kind of freedom of opportunity really isn't just for the individual immigrants. It can often extend to the children. Uh, when I was at the Intel Science Talent Search Competition in 2011, it was a research project I was doing, and I interviewed the, the top 40 finalists. These are the top high school science students in the country. Uh, I found 70% of the students were the children of immigrants, 70%. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the families 
uh, I met with the Hackman family, they actually also came from, from Iran, and they came here because uh, the father felt when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power as a Jewish family, they were you know, in, in fear of what would happen, so they were able with some difficulty to get asylum in the United States. Um, one of their daughters, uh, uh, Michelle, was, it was born in, in America, but she was born with eyesight in only one eye, and in fact, they're from Long Island. On the morning of 9-11, she actually lost sight in her second eye, so she was blind. And yet she was able to be in this Intel Science Talent Competition and actually came in second. Uh, her research project was measuring the anxiety level of teenagers when separated from their cell phones. So, and she had trained researchers to help do the measurements. And, but from the father's perspective, really America offered a, a great opportunity for, for his family because he knew that Michelle, if she was in Iran, she really would have had a great difficulty because being you know, a woman, being Jewish, and having a major disability, three categories that aren't really dealt with, you know, with great equality in Iran, uh, you know, she really would not have had a chance to fulfill her potential, whereas in America, uh, you know, she's, she's got into Yale, She's going to go for a PhD, and she came in second in you know nation's premier uh, science competition for for uh, for young people. Um, so it really shows where the opportunity can extend. Now, those are two of the major reforms, and I'm going to look just briefly go through what this House and Senate has done, and then talk about the third area, legalization, which is really what often gets the most most news coverage. <clears throat> so what has the Senate done so far? Well, what the Senate has done on low-skill visas is they did put together for the first time a real low-skill visa that allows full-year full year work in places like hotels, construction, and restaurants. Unfortunately, they limit it to only the first year only to 20000 a year, which is really not enough, and it would go up to 80000 eventually. could go higher based on a complicated formula. But the reason it's so low is that the AFL-CIO has opposed any sort of temporary visas uh, being put in immigration bills in the past, and so viewed it as they were giving a big concession to even allow the, you know, this number, uh, even though the visas have a certain number of provisions for, you know, have to pay a certain amount, but then it also even allows someone to leave on the, on the, on the first day on the job and go work somewhere else, so it does have a great deal of mobility. Um, the House does not have a provision yet on this. Uh, they passed, the House has passed some smaller bills to the Judiciary Committee, but they haven't introduced a bill on this particular subject. Uh, from talking to congressional staffers, I, I think when the House does do something, it'll have a much, it'll follow the Senate structure on, on low-skill visas, but have much higher numbers, maybe 200, 250,000, uh, where they'd have to be able to get that through the House, uh, and then you'd have an issue of what would the union uh, position be on a bill that you know that has that, uh, that that has that number of work visas. So that's potential confrontation down the road on that issue. On high skill visas, the Senate actually has very good provisions on green cards. They would eliminate the entire employment based backlog um, and set up new new green cards for people getting uh, science and engineering degrees from U.S. universities. So th those would be. Um, you know, positive provisions on H-1B visas, temporary visas. The numbers go up in, in, in the Senate bill. However, they put a lot of new uh, restrictions on companies and, and requirements that companies are still are kind of concerned about. Uh, the House passed a bill just through the Judiciary Committee, not through the whole House uh, so far, that would increase green cards, but not nearly as much in the Senate. And on, um, on unemployment temporary visas, it would have similar numbers increase, but not have as much uh, bureaucracy uh, att attached to the visas as they put in the Senate. And then kind of the biggest issue in terms of political, uh, as a political issue, is what to do about the population of 11 and a half million people who are here, here illegally. What the Senate did is to say that if you fall into the category of DREAM Act, if you fall into the category of agricultural worker, you can continue working for a time, um, and other people over a 10 to 12 year process, all of all those people paying fines, you would be able to get legal status and then potentially green cards. Um, outer bound estimate of maybe 8 million in the Senate bill to get green cards, uh, probably somewhat lower than that as you get through the years and work its way through the program. Um, the House hasn't introduced anything on that yet. Um, 
They, um, it's been really one of the reasons things have been held up in the House, trying to figure out what to do. The House is supposed to uh, come forward with some more specific proposals soon. Uh, I did a paper recently. It's on our website. Um, it's uh, at nfap.com. And what I did is take some of the House comments in terms of saying that if people could get legal status first, in other words, be allowed to stay here legally, and then fit through the legal immigration system by being sponsored by a family member or an employer, that then that would be permitted under, under House legislation. Again, they haven't introduced anything yet, but that's been talked about. So I put some numbers together and found that while the Senate bill would end up giving green cards to more people than the House, that if the House did follow through on this, um, they would end up with, you know, some, uh, you know, maybe four to four to five million people probably by the end of the day who could get green cards. And then the other people would be able to stay here and work legally and not be deported. Um, so that's really the issue. The issue is not uh, necessarily what's sometimes called path to citizenship. Really, it's whether or not uh, people will get legal status that allows them to stay in the country without being deported. And then whether really the issue is the second issue is would they be, get a path to a green card, which allow them, uh, if they got that green card after five years, to be able to uh, apply for citizenship if they choose. Interestingly enough, in the 86 amnesty, um, there was only about 40, only about 40 percent of the people end up applying for citizenship ultimately. So the numbers of people who, at the end of the day, end up getting citizenship out of any sort of immigration legislation is often less than people think. You're not talking about 11.5 million, certainly, um, even under the more generous Senate provision. So what do I think is finally going to happen here? Well, look, it's Washington, D.C., so the easiest thing is to predict nothing good, right? I mean, that's sort of the easy prediction. Uh, but I actually am more optimistic um, than other people have been on this, and I think there's, uh, a, a, you know, I'd say at least a 50% chance of a bill uh, becoming law. Uh, in other words, something would would pass the House uh, in separate bills that looks about the, the way it'll do things, and the Senate will probably amend them in some way, maybe some through some side negotiations, and the House would pass some versions of those. That was probably what the procedure we'd end up seeing. Um, Again, it's nothing's guaranteed. Lots of things can go wrong. Um, but I do think there's a realistic chance because compared to 2006, 2007, where the Senate and House were very far apart, I don't see them, them uh, as being as far apart uh, this time around. Uh, it looks like on, on many of the issues, uh, really, you're, you're almost talking about numbers issues, whether on high-skill and low-skill visas or even on legalization. It's not a matter of whether, uh, but, but how and, and how many. And those kind of uh, debates or negotiations are much easier to, to deal with when it gets down to kind of a numbers debate uh, versus sort of whether you should do anything at all. Um, so in the final analysis, uh, I would say, uh, if you look at low-skill visas, will there be as many low-skill visas as I think should be uh, should should be passed in order to uh, significantly reduce illegal immigration and, and and prevent migrant deaths at the border? No, there won't be, but it'll still be an improvement over the status quo. When you get onto high-skill visas uh, and green cards, will be, will there be as many as uh, as some businesses and others would like for mere competitive? competitiveness reasons. No, there probably won't be, but it'll still be an improvement over the status quo. And when you get to legalization, uh, will, you know, what will happen there? I would say for folks who, who that's their main issue, uh, not everyone who, who's now in the country legally will have a chance at citizenship, uh, but many people will be able to stay here uh, in the country without being deported, and, and some large part of that uh, or significant subset will be able to get a green card. So it would be an improvement for them over the status quo. Um, I mean, the good news is I can come back here in a couple of years and there'll probably still be plenty to talk about. So, <laughs> great. Turn to the professor for some additional comments. Well, uh, I, I thought what I would do uh, is to uh, um, lend some theoretical support uh, from the standpoint of economics for the notion that it is a good idea to uh, liberalize access to visas, to liberalize the flow of 
uh, workers into the United States. Um, and uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the case for uh, free trade, the, uh, the case for liberalized immigration um, is uh, pretty similar in economic terms. Um, uh, we expect workers to migrate from countries where their wages are low compared to uh, wages uh, here in the United States. Uh, uh, they pursue higher wages. And as a result of that migration, uh, total world output will rise. Uh, higher wages in the uh, uh, country of immigration means that uh, the marginal product of labor is higher there. They're producing more value there uh, than they would in their uh, source countries, in their uh, countries of origin. Um, uh, labor migration, then, will generally lead to net gains in wealth for the world as a whole because labor is flowing to the country where it has the higher value use. Uh, and for that basic reason, uh, economic theory raises a presumption in favor of the free movement of labor. Uh, restrictions on that migration distort uh, the global labor market, uh, produces a misallocation of labor among countries, uh, wastes uh, human resources, uh, in less than their higher valued use. Um, now that's uh, the uh, wealth of the country as a whole. Uh, what about the economic interest of natives uh, in the country of immigration? Uh, well, if we look at the impact of immigrants in the labor market, we find that the natives of the host country taken together will gain from the immigration of labor. Um, uh, wages might fall for native workers who uh, compete with immigrant labor. Uh, but if so, that loss uh, for those workers is just a pure transfer among natives. That is, it's offset by an equal gain uh, by the people who employ uh, labor, uh, and ultimately for the consumers who are obtaining goods and services at lower cost. Uh, furthermore, natives gain from employing the immigrant workers. Uh, they gain surplus in excess of what they're paying immigrants for their labor. Uh, if they didn't gain any surplus, they wouldn't be hiring them. Uh, so natives as a group enjoy a net gain from uh, em uh, employing immigrants. Uh, the immigrants, of course, also gain uh, from access to our labor market. A and in that sense, labor migration represents a form of international trade uh, in which the source country exports labor to the host country. Uh, and like international trade in goods, uh, labor migration allows those foreign suppliers to sell their services to domestic buyers, uh, al uh, allowing both parties to gain uh, from trade in the labor market. Um, now, uh, nevertheless, countries will often restrict immigration, um, in part to protect native workers uh, from the unemployment or wage reductions uh, that the entry of those foreign workers uh, would supposedly entail. Uh, and in that sense, immigration barriers, like trade barriers, are protectionist. They're designed to protect natives from foreign competition. Uh, and protectionists will often defend these barriers as policies to promote uh, a more equal distribution among natives, uh, pointing to the adverse effects of immigration, uh, especially the least skilled immigrants, uh, on the welfare of the least skilled workers. Um, and although the economic effects of immigration on native workers and distributive justice among natives uh, are often advanced as reasons to restrict immigration, uh, I'll argue that those concerns don't provide a sound justification for restrictive immigration laws. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we should note that concerns regarding income inequality among natives uh, doesn't justify any restrictions on skilled immigration uh, because skilled immigrants not only increase total wealth for natives, uh, but also promote a more equitable distribution of wealth among natives. Uh, if they have an adverse effect, it's going to be on competing skilled natives, uh, and they will increase the real wages of everybody else in the economy, uh, including less skilled natives uh, who are enjoying the benefits of an increased supply of skilled labor. Uh, so the pursuit of a more equal distribution among natives would at most justify concerns regarding uh, the least skilled uh, immigrants. Um, but if we turn to that question, uh, studies of the effects of immigration in 
labor markets in the United States have shown little evidence of any significant effects on native wages or employment, even for the least skilled native workers. Uh, so given uh, the small uh, effects that shows up uh, in the empirical uh, evidence, uh, uh, protectionist policies seem particularly misguided. Uh, well, how can that be? How do immigrants have so little impact on the wages and employment of natives? One reason is that the demand for labor doesn't stay fixed when immigrants enter the economy. Uh, immigrant workers don't just supply labor, they demand goods and services. And that demand will translate into greater demand for locally supplied labor. Uh, furthermore, an influx, uh, an influx of labor will create profit opportunity for investors, which will in turn attract capital uh, to the economic activities employing the immigrant labor. And that expansion in the sector of the economy employing that labor will also increase the demand for labor, uh, which will in turn tend to offset the effect uh, of any increase in supply. Um, but finally, the empirical evidence uh, 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 also indicates that immigrants and natives are not perfect substitutes in the labor market. So they're not often competing uh, for the same jobs. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, immigrants compete with one another far more than they compete with natives. Um, uh, in fact, uh, some immigrant labor can be a complement rather than a substitute for some native labor so that an increase in the supply of immigrant labor can be uh, 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 can cause an increase in demand for native labor and thus have a positive effect on native wages rather than a negative effect. Um, uh, uh, so for all of those reasons, uh, distributive justice is not a particularly uh, good justification for protectionism. Um, well, uh, how should we go about uh, expanding uh, uh, the supply of visas for, uh, uh, for workers, uh, for alien workers? Um, uh, the proposal that we see uh, uh, on the table uh, for the least skilled workers tend to be uh, guest worker programs. And from the perspective of the economic interest of natives, uh, that might make sense. Uh, uh, that way you give uh, 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 foreign workers access to your labor markets, but you don't have to bear the fiscal burden of providing the full set of public benefits uh, that those workers would receive if they had ready access to permanent residence uh, and ultimately citizenship. Um, uh, that's because uh, alien workers admitted on these non-immigrant visas uh, are not admitted as permanent residents and, and are thus not eligible for most public entitlements um, and aren't eligible to naturalize uh, 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 until they uh, gain permanent residence. Um, uh, so because uh, 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 these aliens um, under federal law are ineligible for any federal public benefit. Uh, uh, they pose uh, uh, pretty much no risk of, uh, of a fiscal burden, uh, a burden on the public treasury. Um, now, uh, uh, the uh, guest worker program uh, idea uh, is subject to the criticism that it is inconsistent with democratic ideals um, uh, uh, permanent status uh, as an alien uh, uh, is uh, anathema uh, to uh, those ideals. Uh, and, and so uh, we have the insistence that there ought to be a path for citizenship uh, for, uh, for guest workers, um, uh, whether we're talking about uh, uh, new guest workers or uh, uh, unauthorized immigrants with some sort of legal status. Uh, and that raises the question, uh, doesn't that raise the prospect of a fiscal burden uh, if we grant them access to permanent residence uh, and, 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 and thus the ability to naturalize uh, and gain citizenship? Uh, and that's not necessarily so, uh, because by requiring guest workers to spend some years in non-immigrant status first, you're delaying their access to the full set of public benefits that we provide to citizens. Uh, that delay itself will improve the fiscal impact uh, of each uh, low-skilled immigrant. Uh, and the longer the delay, the greater the improvement 
uh, in the uh, immigrants' fiscal impact. Um, and here, empirical evidence indicates that we could allow even uh, uh, a low-skilled immigrant to naturalize without imposing a fiscal burden uh, if a sufficient period of alienage uh, has passed uh, with limited access to public benefits. Uh, and here it's important to realize that access to citizenship uh, is really a matter of degree. It's not a black or white issue. Uh, guest workers might have the opportunity to adjust their status to permanent residence only after a short period or perhaps after a long period. Uh, we could choose any point along that continuum to satisfy critics who are concerned about the fiscal uh, impact uh, of low-skilled immigrants um, uh, and, and thereby uh, uh, reach a, a compromise uh, that might uh, uh, satisfy uh, uh, critics uh, of the idea uh, uh, on either side of the political spectrum. Uh, and here, it may be useful uh, to have the sort of points system that has been proposed uh, in comprehensive immigration reform uh, in the past and in the Senate bill uh, that was passed last year. Uh, that bill would create a new uh, track for uh, immigrant visas uh, that would allocate visas based on points, um, including points awarded on the basis of U.S. work experience. And by adjusting the points awarded for work experience, uh, perhaps experience gained while, at, uh, while a guest worker, um, and by adjusting the total number of immigrant visas issued through that uh, uh, point system, we can adjust the guest worker's prospects for permanent residence uh, and the number of years that a guest worker could expect uh, to wait to adjust status. Um, and here's where I think we have uh, uh, some possibility of compromise uh, between the House approach and the Senate approach, uh, that if the normal immigration system is liberalized uh, uh, to make access for green cards more realistic uh, for, uh, for those who uh, don't have permanent residence already, uh, that'll make it more palatable um, uh, 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 to, um, uh, uh, to eliminate the special path to citizenship that we see in the Senate bill uh, and tell um, uh, say legalized workers or guest workers, uh, you get to apply through the normal immigration system if that normal immigration system has been liberalized uh, in, in the sorts of ways that uh, Mr. Anderson has discussed. That's a good question, and it's obviously one of the objections people might have to, to increasing uh, guest workers or temporary visa categories. I think probably the most important thing to, to take it from the realm of kind of theoretical immigrants or theoretical workers to the practical reality. The practical reality is if you have new temporary visas for people to come in legally, we're not really necessarily talking about brand new workers that never would have come to the United States. What we're really talking about is taking the current illegal flow and replacing them with a legal flow. And if someone's concerned about competition, um, you, you know, the competition would be much more balanced if both the U.S. worker 
and the incoming worker both have legal status. They're less likely to be exploited. And again, I'm all for having a legal visa regime that allows people to leave their job and go work at the, you know, at a second job, not necessarily being tied to the one particular employer. And it's really even also the same principle for the people who are in the country illegally. While they wouldn't technically, if you legalize their status, they would pretty much be free agents. They wouldn't actually be tied to any particular employers. Um, and I think they also would be competing against other workers for jobs. Uh, again, not necessarily for all the same jobs, as the professor pointed out. Um, but they would be doing it without um, kind of the, with the, the current disadvantage of being in a legal status, fearing uh, that they can't change jobs because they might not be getting another one because of the immigration laws. And um, so I think this kind of competition uh, can be overstated because you're talking about a kind of new reality. In other words, you'd have people who have greater legal rights than, than, they, than they would today. So that's one aspect of it. And the professor could talk more about the economic aspect. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would emphasize the uh, lack of empirical evidence that there is a serious impact um, uh, there. Uh, there's likely to be an impact on uh, the least skilled uh, native workers. Uh, all the evidence suggests it would be small, small enough that, that if that's your concern, uh, you could uh, probably uh, address that concern um, uh, 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 easily through uh, <coughs> some uh, modest change in the progressivity of the tax system. Uh, you could probably do more good for the least skilled workers, uh, native workers, with, at, at lower cost to the economy uh, by uh, adjusting the progressivity of your, of your fiscal policies. I mean, in general, the reason why immigration you know, has often happened, period, is that immigrants tend to fill in niches in the labor market at both the high and low end. And I think that's why we see so many immigrants coming in to fill some of these lower skilled jobs, not necessarily lots of accountants running across the border, for example. You know, you know, you know, you tend to see people who are more filling niches. Uh, and that's agricultural work is probably the most obvious example where uh, you know, most of us are not, you know, don't have experience anymore as maybe 100 years ago with going and do the type of work, the farm work that, that often is done on those kind of visas, or in many cases not, not the visas because they're coming in illegally because the current visa category doesn't really work very well for agriculture. Oh, let's go here and then go back down. You mentioned, the, uh, you mentioned briefly the role of unions and, um, and you know, sort of strikes me that President Chang, you know, here's a group that isn't necessarily as concerned about the, uh, you know, the whole country's well-being economically, rather just looking out for a local union or a local sort of workforce's interests. Um, I guess my question is mostly practical. Um, wh where do you see the, the role of the unions in the, in, in the upcoming sort of political debate? Is there a way to and is there, more philosophically, is there a way to talk to the union interests in a way that will um, allay some or assuage some of their concerns? Well, I, I would regard it as one of the virtues of the comprehensive approach to immigration reform um, that you can create a package with different elements that appeal to different interest groups. Um, uh, in the, the Senate bill, you've got uh, legalization for the unauthorized immigrants, which the labor unions are interested in because uh, they would like to be able to unionize these workers um, and, and uh, uh, without the employers threatening them with, uh, uh, with reporting them to the authorities and getting them deported. Um, uh, uh, so they, uh, they've developed a stake in that part of the deal. Um, uh, you've got the Chamber of Commerce that's interested in a different part of the deal. Uh, and by and you've got uh, restrictionists who want tougher border enforcement. So you put these things together, you got a package that no one is entirely happy with. Uh, but if you succeed, you've got something that's an improvement over the status quo from the perspective of, the, of each of the groups that you're you're dealing with. And I think that's why it's important to link all of this stuff together to, uh, to actually uh, sell the whole package. 
Right, I think that's right, and I think in addition, the the union politics are a little more nuanced than maybe people think. In other words, there used to be uh, a number of, of unions that were part of the AFL-CIO that were really geared much more towards with Latino members, um, uh, Unite, for example. Uh, and the, for that group, I don't think the opposition to temporary visas is as strong as with the AFL-CIO itself because they're interested, as the professor said, in getting legalized status. The AFL-CIO does have members that they, you know does have members that would get legalized or people who they'd like to unionize who would get legalized but it's not as you know as as big a deal for them and so I think they feel they can take a harder line on the temporary visa aspect uh, and in the past they've taken a line of, of none as the correct number <laughs> so I think she had one and then we'll go yes uh, sorry if I missed this it seems like a lot of talks, you know, path to citizenship. What are the, I guess, the benefits and costs of the U.S. and then I guess benefits the immigrants of converting green cards to citizenship? I mean, is this really like, very important? You mean for individuals? For individuals, and even you know, any burdens on the United States, you know, for having that. Well, I mean, for I mean, we're talking about just from taxpayer point of view in the initial stage. You know, the immigrants tend to pay their fees for the immigration service tends to be funded by by fees. So there's that. So the direct costs aren't really that great for the, for the taxpayer. As Professor was pointing out, at some point, people can become eligible for benefits. Uh, but kind of in the bigger perspective, more workers tend to be very positive for the entitlement programs because we have what's called, uh, in particular in Social Security, a pay-as-you-go system. So having more workers come in helps fund, actually, the retirement of current retirees. Uh, so. Uh, and Social Security actuaries have written about this quite a bit, and basically in every single report. Um, I really think that you know, you know the costs are really not so much. We shouldn't necessarily just look at the fiscal. The issue is sort of as a society. I think those are some of the broader questions people are, ha are having on this issue. Uh, is it better for assimilation purposes if people are here, but they can't have a chance of getting a green card? And then if you get a green card, get a chance of citizenship. So these are kind of bigger philosophical issues in some way in terms of how you want people to be able to have a chance to integrate in the society. I think for a lot of people who are here in the country illegally, they would be happy with a status that falls short of a permanent residence, which then could allow citizenship if you told them they wouldn't have a fear of deportation and they could stay with their family. Because one of the statistics I didn't point out about why and what Press and I are talking about where people fitting in through the legal immigration system. Why the numbers are, get up there uh, quite a bit is that, for example, there are 4.4 million unauthorized immigrants with U.S. born children. I mean, that's like a, a very large number of people. Um, and that's not even counting other unauthorized immigrants who have children who maybe aren't U.S. born children but are here. So they're not likely to leave. And even if they were deported, many of them would want to, you know, try to come back, come back in. But you know, fearing being separated, fear of being separated from them is a, is a motivating factor in having just some sort of relief. Yes. Um, Professor, you mentioned the point system, which I think is um, quite interesting uh, because my parents came into Canada on that point system, but. Um, there was, and this was floated in 2007 uh, proposals in the immigration bill in the U.S. But there are some drawbacks to that system as well, such as its inflexibility. And I'm wondering if either of you can speak to that a little bit. I mean, I, I mean, the way it's done in the Senate bill, I don't have as much a problem with, because as the professor pointed out, it was kind of almost an adjunct to the current system. Um, what I didn't like in the 2007 bill, they would have actually replaced almost all family and employment immigration and put it in through a point system. And I think what you're alluding to in Canada, one of the problems is is taking away from the U.S. system for employers where employers can identify a particular individual that they want to hire and keep with them long term and, and offer and, you know, and, and sponsor them for permanent residence. I think that's a better system or at least an important part of any system to keep. Because really, one of the best indicators of whether someone will fit in well in the U.S. economy is that someone actually wants to hire them. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think that was one of the big concerns that employers had about the 2007 approach that would have just jettisoned all that 
and you would have had um, you know, people who had maybe very good paper credentials who weren't necessarily the people you had. And I had done analysis that when that point out that when you had that 2007 system and if you kept in per, per country limits, uh, basically people from India and China would have been really left out to a large extent. And I don't think it had been really felt, thought through. Uh, pretty much the way it would have worked is if you had very modest skills and you were from Denmark or Iceland, you, had a, you would have had a much better chance of getting through the point system than if you had like a master's degree in electrical engineering if you were Indian or Chinese. So, they're, they're, you know, when you get too bureaucratic of a system, you can end up with some unintended consequences. Yeah, I would agree. It, it, it's important to emphasize that the Senate bill uh, doesn't do away with the existing system. It adds on point system. Um, it does away with some of the existing systems. Right. It sort of folds it into the point right. system. But it doesn't do that. It, it, it creates uh, multiple avenues for integration, the point system being only one of them. Right. And I would say one of the things that makes it maybe less likely that some of the provisions in the Senate bill will become law is that they are just much more generous than the House is intending to, <laughs> to have them. Um, you know, the numbers you know, the, House, the Senate, if you added up the green cards, not even counting legalization per se, but just kind of the standing system, um, is probably, you know, some hundreds of thousands of green cards a year above what the House is intending to do based on what's passed the Judiciary Committee. So, uh, but, you know, one of the reforms I'd like to see also, and the professor alluded to this, is a way for, for, lower skill, for employers to sponsor lower skilled individuals for green cards right now. There's only about 5,000 of those green cards allowed a year, including the dependents. Uh, so it just seems to me that if a restaurant, you know, likes a worker, and, you know, the person may move up through the restaurant, uh, you know, to manager or something, you know, th there's no reason why a company should be able to petition for them the same way Intel, uh, you know, petitions for an engineer. A few more minutes. Anyone wants last yeah, um, Professor Kane, uh, in the beginning of your speech, you talked about how um, uh, I guess there's a efficiency argument for having labor flow uh, across the world. And I agree with that, but um, I was wondering um, what can you point to for your argument that it helps the native um, economy as a whole as well? Um, I, I guess the way I understand it is I, I feel like a lot of the money is sent back to the source country. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, so I was wondering if you could say, like, how that helps the natives. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the flow of remittances uh, is a benefit to the folks left behind in the, in, in the source country. Uh, that doesn't change the bottom line for, uh, for the receiving country. The receiving country gets the benefit of the immigrant's labor, uh, and they receive a benefit that exceeds the wages paid to that worker. Uh, that's a gain from